you can be taught certain things, but I don't think you can really be taught to be an actor. And you're given a gift, you see, we're all given gifts, and actors are given this gift, and it is a calling. I don't want to sound too pompous, but the, the drive to be an actor is just something you cannot push under the carpet and get rid of. It will out, and you're either lucky or you're unlucky, and I'm very lucky to have been lucky. The Peter Cushing radio interview came about in May 1986. It was the day after the royal premiere for the film Biggles, and we were meant to record just a short kind of 10 minutes to help promote the film. But we got on so incredibly well, and we ended up recording and chatting for well over an hour, just talking away on the sofa. You know, we talked about everything and anything from his start in the profession, working at Hammer, and all the different roles that he's played over the years. 30 years later, that interview was still sitting in the archive, and I was thinking, well, what can we do with that? Because so much of this interview has not been heard by people before, and that's what led us to create Peter Cushing in his own words, a very special, very personal documentary that we released in 2019, around the time of the 25th anniversary of Peter's passing. And now with Peter Cushing Perspectives, we've got the opportunity to revisit some of that material and pull out some of the key moments and also add in some new things that weren't in the original documentary for a fresh appreciation of Peter, a fresh look at who he was and his career, and try and understand a little bit more about why he was so iconic, why he was so loved by audiences then and today, and how he's ended up giving us such an outstanding contribution to our popular culture. I only worked with him for those six weeks, doing uh, Frankenstein Created Woman, but I, I met him, I first saw him when I was 15 years old. Uh, in our road in those days, there was only one telly. And on Sunday nights, I used to go along to my mates who owned this telly to watch uh, Saturday Night Theatre. And one Sunday, I saw 1984, the George Orwell. And it was in black and white. And it was probably live, can you believe? And playing the starring role was the wonderful Peter Cushing. And I thought, he was amazing. And I, I, from that Sunday night, I became a avid fan and looked at his films and, you know, his horror films. And then 12 years later, there I was on the set standing next to the great man, I was totally in awe. I thought, I really don't believe this, that I'm actually standing on a set, you know, with Peter Cushing, and and he looked so, so frightening. He had this face that was, looked so evil, and he was the complete opposite. He was the most gentle man. When I first met Peter, um, it was when, um, 1968, when we had the presentation of the Queens of War to Industry at Pinewood Studios. And, of course, we was all there on the stage at Pinewood for the presentation, and Peter Cushing was obviously invited. We'd had the lunch, our menus had an autograph page, and I wanted him to sign it, and uh, went round the room and uh, said, Oh, Mr Cushing, you know, do you mind signing my... Uh, menu, oh, dear boy, yes, of, of course, dear boy. Very approachable um, and just a nice guy, and I think that's what endeared him to many people. You often look at actors on screen and you wonder what they're like in real life. Uh, and some uh, disappoint uh, and some make you think, wow, that's exactly how I'd imagine. And the thing about Peter Cushing was, from everyone who met him and everyone who knew him, uh, and Christopher Lee told me this, he was, as you'd expect, he was a gentle man, very considerate of other people. Um, he loved his art, he loved the work, he loved acting. He got a little bit frustrated, I think, with filmmaking because it wasn't, it didn't flow in the way that he could flow on stage. But he was just a kind-hearted person um, and he was always very considerate of other actors. Uh, and I think that's, when you get people in the industry speaking only good of someone, you know they were a good person and Peter was a good person. He took things very seriously, and I'm sure he often made films and things that were not really to the standard that he might have wished, but he gave it his all because he, he always used to say to me that it was a duty to the audience. It's a duty 
to your profession. It's a duty to your fellow actor to be as good as you can be. It's not just a case of turning up, learning your lines, hitting your mark, take the paycheck and go. It's a case of looking into the role, understanding the part, doing some research on it, learning the script back to front, uh, and understand the other person's position. So, for instance, if they were doing a, a, a take where they were filming the other person, he would insist on standing there and saying the lines to the other person rather than sometimes a, a stand-in would do that or the script girl or somebody would do that because the star would disappear off rather than waste, waste their time. But to Peter, that wasn't a waste of time. It was giving his fellow actor the courtesy of being able to have eye contact with the person he was supposed to be speaking to him. His voice was very soft and he was very... He was always very polite and interesting and always interested. And, you know, we had long chats and he used to come up to me and say, oh, how are you, Derek? I mean, this great face. I said, I'm very well, thank you. He said, are you being a good boy? I said, well, so far. And uh, he, towards the end, and during the shoot, which was only six weeks, six wonderful weeks, I couldn't wait uh, to get to work, uh, to be with him and the wonderful Thorley Walters. And, and Peter was always saying, you know, what have you been doing and what's coming up for you and I wish you luck and, and uh, good fortune. And I thought he was the most incredible actor, but also the most wonderful man. Well, it's really very strong in my memory of how kind and caring and sweet-natured he was. Um, and there was just the two of us in this scene. There were a few other sort of people around, but he, he was just focused on m my well-being, really avuncular and beautiful. And I was very struck by this. I think he was maybe even projecting because he had spent such a long time nursing his wife. Uh, he was in a very, very caring mo mode. And I was very struck by how kind, caring, and apparently interested in me uh, when he was the suffering one, but he was also the main actor. It's a great performance that he gives in Twins of Evil, I think. Anyone to do with television in those days would rather look frowned upon by the film companies because they were emptying the cinemas. People found they could just switch a switch and get all the entertainment they wanted at home. James Carillas felt if there was someone well known and popular on television, if he could lure him into doing a film, in turn, that actor would lure people back to the cinema. And I read that. Hammers were going to do amongst their five films, they did five films a year, and among them was Frankenstein. And the schedule was uh, two and a half weeks, uh, and, and the budget was about 65,000 pounds. I mean, it was really nothing to make a picture of. And then anyway, I rang up my uh, agent and said, I see that Hammers are doing this, and I know that you've told me they've always been wanting to use me. So I said, this is one I'd like to do. They want me, here I am. So they accepted me, which is nice. And Terence Fisher, that darling man who directed so many of those pictures, said, I cannot do it in two and a half weeks. I will try and keep within the budget, but you must give me three. So eventually we got four weeks. And America could not believe it was made in that time or, or for that amount of money because it looked absolutely magnificent. But again, where James Carreras was so clever, he got the best people he could in all departments, the best cameraman, the best makeup, the best set designer, and pretty jolly good all-round cast, and paid off, you see. And to their amazement, within literally, I think, a couple of weeks, it had paid for itself, and they became millionaires. Peter Cushing, perhaps if anything, was overly detailed and such that he didn't really um, have much truck with me, sad to say. He was so busy ensconced in the corner with dear Shane Bryant going through his detailed notes, you know, with a pounce nay on the end of his nose, um, making absolutely sure that his every hand movement and every gesture and every line was given enough weight and enough, you know, emphasis. But he would keep sort of himself to himself 
um, just sitting on the side of the, the set, you know, reading his script, making notes. And when called to do his scene, he would be on set. He would just deliver the lines perfectly. He knew all his lines. He never dried or messed up any lines when I ever saw him on set. And um, he just had a very professional attitude and, as you said, very nice nice chap, really, wasn't he? he was, um, <coughs> That's right. He's yeah. he very, very, very kind. Everything you, you did, he very thanked you for. It certainly paid off in as much as there were no retakes ever. I can't remember him ever shouting that he would like to do something again, um, which would, of course, for the director and also my dear friend, the first assistant director, Derek Whitehouse, was a gift. So for filmmaking particularly, I would say that his attention to detail was just, as I say, manna from heaven. But he could sort of throw himself into the action. When, when the director called action, he would have his shot of adre adrenaline and literally take off, whether it was a fight sequence or just delivering lines or moving around quite quickly. You think, oh, seconds ago, he was sitting down looking rather <laughs> pale and, uh, and sort of a bit delicate. The next minute, he could throw himself across the set and be, have a fight sequence, a, you know, but not a major fight sequence, but still a fight sequence, and, um, and do it again when he had to do take two. He didn't do an awful lot of retakes. He always seemed to get it right most of the time, first, first take. I can understand actors sitting very quietly and because they're doing all the work and then suddenly the word action and the camera happens or the curtain goes up and then something, something magical takes over. And uh, is that why we do it? I don't know. One thing that really came out about Peter when we were making the original documentary was his incredible reputation as an actor. Not just as someone who could inhabit a character and then portray that character on screen, but he was incredibly well prepared when he was on set. He knew his lines absolutely thoroughly and the lines of all the other actors too, so he could help and support them and encourage them to give their best performance. As others have said, he was great as a prop actor. He could pick things up, put things down and do that again and again if further retakes were needed. But, you know, I think it's the fact that he had so much care and consideration for his fellow actors. That's what really endeared him to people. That's why they loved him and that's why they all wanted to work with him. What takes the time is that they do the master shot of all four of us and the camera way over there. It takes say, about an hour to light and the scene takes, well, a couple of minutes. But then you sit, come say, you, your, your, your three quarter shot would be done and then your close-ups, and then the same with you, and then you, and then me. Different lighting each time. This is what takes the time. That This is, comes to the technical, what I mean by uh, the technical side, and as far as an actor's concerned, he really should know exactly what, not only he's doing in the script, but everyone else is in, in the, the, the script as written, so that you know how uh, you're going to react. What is it? I was thrilled to be working with this icon, and he was an icon. He was an icon. I, I considered myself to be quite a serious actress, not a sort of frivolous um, person. He was a real icon for actors because he was such a superb actor. He, um, he was just brilliant, you know, and, and, and to work opposite him. Now, I look back at that scene and how privileged was I to have that scene. And while we were waiting for the set-ups, we'd chat a little bit. Uh, he, he did mention he'd just lost his wife. He clearly didn't want to go into any more about that, but he was such a sweet, very avuncular to me as a young woman, really lovely. So we got on really well, and I just thought, oh, I love this man, I love him. So anyway, we go to do it, and then... He changed. He just changed. He changed into this, you know, this ogre, this terrifying man. On action, his face changed, everything changed. You see him in the film, he is terrifying. Some people say it's his best performance um, in Twins of Evil. Um, whether that was helped by his recent um, bereavement, uh, but he was just so severe and so awful and so frightening, which was wonderful for an actor to work with because... He, he really frightened me, especially as he, two minutes before, he'd been sort of being, you're going to be all right, you're going to be all right. They're going to burn you and, uh, you know, they throw you on the floor. Uh, but then he was really, really terrifying. And it was a terrifying scene to do. And it's become an iconic scene, that, actually. Now, the burning and him 
standing there and he, him praying up to um, to the gods to save this woman's soul. And so um, I, I feel now, in retrospect, very, very lucky to have got that part and chosen that part, in fact. There was a very bonny looking uh, brief appearance by Peter Cushing in The Vampire Lovers uh, at the beginning in a ball scene, and that's the end of him, bless him. And then, horror, horror, what, three years later? Certainly not more, two to three years later, I made Frankenstein and the Monster from Hell, and I got such a shock. He actually looked like the living dead. He looked like one of those, you know, corpses lying in, in the coffins. He looked horrendous. I, I couldn't understand how he had the strength for such a vital performance that he gave. He gave so much to it, he gave everything to it. And he and Shane Bryant, the adorable Shane Bryant, little blondie, um, used to sit in the corner going over their copious notes together and Shane and he with their, their heads together um, going through the script. It was a meticulous script and Peter treated it meticulously. Exquisitely dressed with a little wig on. I think his hair had gone quite thin at that time. And very much the gentleman. It must have been extraordinarily difficult for Peter to pick up work after Helen died. But he knew, like we all know in life, um, he had to keep himself busy. And so he took on work, he was offered work, and even if you look at him on screen and you could see he was more sallow, slightly more emaciated, wasn't quite as animated, it was keeping him busy. It was almost a, a good, well, it was a good thing for him to be able to do it. Um, and and it, not just because his fans expected it, I'm sure he would have been quite happy to stay at home if he, if, but, but he needed to fill his time. And I've heard that before in, in several places. I heard that the late Dame Thora heard she'd been married for over 50 years to her Jimmy. He passed away and she says, I miss him every day and I can't wait till I'm back with him, but I'm not going to do anything to speed that process along. I know when it's God's will, I'll be there. And I think the same was the case with Peter. He wanted to be back with Helen. He missed her every day. But his faith said, when the time is right. And in the meantime, he kept himself busy. And I think that's, that's a good way uh, to do it because it's, it, it showed he could still act. It showed he was still had the ability. He, he was in, in some great films, some not so great films too, let's be honest, but some great films nonetheless. Uh, and if it hadn't have been for throwing himself back into it, we'd never have seen him in, in Star Wars. And look what that's done uh, over, over the last 40 years. So... Life has a way of, of playing things out, and thankfully, Peter didn't shut himself away. Uh, and even if it was for his own sanity, he kept his fans and the film industry very happy for several years. I never met her, but the way he talked about her, you know, when we were on our own, sometimes he would uh, say he was very, very happy. You know, and he said, are you very happy, Derek? And I said, yes. Yes. Well, he was always so interested in you, and that was quite rare uh, with some actors. I, I really was so impressed, and those six weeks were very special because of him. And uh, I just loved watching him, and when I was on the set, I kept looking at him, thinking... God, pinch me somebody, but uh, sadly only six weeks, but they've lived with me all my, all my career, really. I always try and do something that I, I never think, now what would I like to do? I think, what do I think people would rather see me in? I mean, supposing I think there's a, a, there's a sort of a, a conceited actor or I'd love to play Hamlet. But who wants to see me as Hamlet, even if I could play it? As opposed to playing Frankenstein. And the balance comes way down on Frankenstein because the audience of the people and actors there to, the, 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 you know, we are pleased to serve and serve to please. Uh, and they're the people to cater for. People don't give him credit for being, for his versatility. You know, because he's, he's aligned with these roles, they don't give him, that's why he's such a wonderful actor. His versatility is um, second to none, really. I think because he always looks, it's very genuine, the appeal of his work. It's uh, the early Frankenstein, which I like, The Curse of Frankenstein, and 
and the Dracula movie, the first two, are oh, probably, for me anyway, where, he's, where he was at his best. He's, he's totally believable in them. You watch the films and you, even saying some of the, what you could say, slightly ridiculous dialogue at the time, but it was, he made it all believable. He made it all convincing. And he carried that right through, I think, even to up to The Frankenstein Must Be Destroyed, which again is one of my favourites, because um, he's very uh, in control of all the dialogue he's saying. Everything he says, you believe. He did a film here called um, The Naked Edge with Gary Cooper, the last film ever made by Gary Cooper in 1960. Uh, he did uh, films uh, of all sorts of... I can think back... Uh, of course, Sherlock Holmes loved him, and Sherlock Holmes in Hound of the Baskervilles and the television series that followed for the BBC later on, and and uh, even right towards the end of his career, things like Big Alls and uh, the Doctor Who films... The films he made for Amicus, lovely character roles he played in different films there. Uh, so, as a body of work, hugely uh, significant, I think, and, and much more v varied. But, but he looks great as well. He really looks. Yeah, he looked the part. He's the great character in his face, uh, and he that's it, he does become believable. Mm. <clears throat> And he, he just looks, uh, you, you can watch the screen up there, and there he is, and it, it's, it, he just looks good. It works. I'm often asked if I've worked with Christopher Lee, which I haven't done. Um, they're both fantastic figureheads, really. They're, Hammer was lucky to find them, really, because they both had extraordinary charisma. Uh, Peter Cushing had, I mean, Ralph Bates took his part, and he's a very clever actor and a lovely guy. Um, but he didn't have, wouldn't have had, didn't have Peter's charisma. Something He has something indefinable about his work. As well as being a wonderful actor, he has, a, I can only say it's a charisma, really. Everything he does, your eyes are on him. A lot of people say that Peter Cushing was the gentleman of horror, and I suppose in many ways that's perfectly true. Yes, he was a very gentle, very caring man, and that certainly came across that afternoon we spent together in May 1986. And yes, he did do an awful lot of work in the horror genre for Hammer and for Amicus. But we shouldn't forget the real diversity of his work, the many other roles and characters that he took on. He was Sherlock Holmes, incredibly successful as Sherlock Holmes, a role he was born to play. He was Doctor Who, a role he didn't quite enjoy as much, but he certainly played Doctor Who up on the big screen. And for many, many people, and for younger generations in particular, they'll remember him as Grand Moff Tarkin in Star Wars. But he made an absolutely wonderful contribution to our popular culture, as I've said many times before. But he's also got an incredible legacy that he's left behind as well. And I think we should feel very grateful that there's all this film and TV work that we can go back and revisit over and over again and remind ourselves just how much of a great actor Peter Cushing really was. Bad is all jolly good part. I mean, dear old Humphrey Bogart was a bad. He was so superb, wasn't he? And I've been lucky. I had some good baddies today. It's rather nice, isn't it? Good baddies. But Star Wars, you know, is a bit of a beast, wasn't he? The only reason I looked so cross in there is my feet hurt. I was wearing shoes that were far too tight for me. I was so angry with everyone. <laughs> Star Wars elevated him into a, a fan base that will be everlasting because um, Star Wars is a phenomenon that goes across the world. I mean, I'm, I'm always amazed. People from all over the world contact me on something, wanting to know something about Star Wars and, and things. And, uh, and so I think that's will ensure that his fame endures, but it will also endure by film fans who love the films he did, especially in this country, for Hammer and for Amicus, and the other films he did, uh, which were wide and varied, as we spoke earlier about. And So I think his body of work will stand the test of time. One of the things that makes him a really, really good actor is he's not casual about his approach at all. He takes it all very seriously. I think that's the key to these performances that he gives. I think because he doesn't send it up, which he could have done and he could do, he takes it seriously, he's a fine actor, and I think that is the key to the whole success of it. Well, people had great respect for him. Yeah. You know, the unit would, would you know, if, if any of the assistant directors, yeah, sir, you know, can you do this, sir? There'd, there'd be sir there. <clears throat> yes, okay, dear boy was the great respect for him. Oh, I think there? so, yes. 
Yes, because they well, he could do the job. This is the most important thing. He'd know he'd know all the lines. He'd know the character, and um, he could he could do the job required. Well, I mean, in the film industry, um, just the name Peter Cushing is uh, is iconic, and he is a legend. And anyone who goes back into the archives and see sees what Peter achieved as an actor, and as you say, his body of work is, is phenomenal. And he will live forever. He'll always be uh, connected with Hammer Horror, and he'll always be Baron Frankenstein, really. But uh, his other work, you know, whatever Peter did, was touched with class and a bit of genius. There is no one like Peter and that face and that voice together. And uh, he was a joy. There are always so many people to thank and be thankful for. And I do uh, and have done and always will. But there's one person that I wouldn't be sitting here. You would be talking to you in this wonderful way today if it hadn't been my dear wife. Not only physically would I not be here, but I certainly wouldn't be in what I think is quite an enviable position that I, I hold in the affection of my fellow actors and audiences throughout the world, which is uh, what actor can ask for more.